Welcome, welcome. Um, first of all, I'm so grateful to have you uh, here today. Um, everyone, if you're joining in, this is an incredible, beautiful brother. Um, and I was guided very clearly to ask George to be with us today. And um, I want to sort of begin by sort of just opening up this energy. If you're coming in, you know, live uh, for this, the first time that it's aired, or if you're coming in at any particular timeline in the future, this is a space of divine holy love, and it's a space of God source energy, universal love with the cosmos. And um, I'm a very galactic being. I've said that, that to George already. Um, and George, I wanna just sort of open up the, um, sort of this, this little cocoon that we have in this timeless time capsule, um, and just sort of start off with asking you about anything that's on your heart that you'd like to sort of open up this energy with. Well, thank you for having me on your, you know, your talk, your podcast. I mean, it's it's an amazing time in our civilization that we're here, um, and for many people, it can feel very uncertain because everything appears to be upside down, and what is left is right, what is truth is depicted as fiction, and vice versa. But it is also a time of an amazing opportunity for humans to step into this new. Um, this new earth that we've all come here to partake in. And I think part of our jobs are to show, light a candle literally for that pathway, which of course it's the hero's journey. It, 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 as we're in Sagittarius season, we can link into that uh, archetype of um, journeying together because when we're together, it's uh, that much more enjoyable and easier. Beautifully said. And I love how you've brought in astrology already. Um, so it's very interesting to me how this has all aligned. And I believe that nothing is by coincidence in my life anyways, I can speak for myself. Um, and I know that everything that has happened in my life is very much, uh, very precise and that metaphysical, um, alchemy that exists is really why I was drawn to you. And I know that you've come in sort of at this particular point in my journey, um, I'm sort of 11 years in of being awake, so to speak, and I'm into that 12th cycle sort of coming around as we arc around sort of um, the sun, so to speak, into January. Um, and my life changed very specifically um, 11 years ago, 12 years ago in March. So I feel like that master ascension cycle is sort of swinging around in my life. And it's interesting to me that you've come in at that particular sort of exact moment, this last sort of space where I'm I think that I'm actually sort of ultimately an ascended being. And I say this with humility, but I'm much more ascended than I used to be. And I really try to represent my highest self and manifest. And I feel that you do the same thing. And all that that means to me is that you live from your heart with your soul and you understand source. So I wanted to ask you, I think how, how long have you actually been sort of awake, so to speak in your, um, you know, in your public life? It's a very difficult one to answer that. I mean, firstly, when you were speaking about your life, really you're talking about a Jupiter cycle, which is Jupiter that's the most benefic, the most uh, generous of the archetypes of the planets. So when we look at our 12-year cycles, they're very powerful, especially when we're manifesting good things, because to bring on the archetype of Jupiter, what is expansive, what is generous, what is kind, and above all, what is truthful. And so you're, it's interesting that I should come in to your life on your Jupiter return. Um, it, I, I mean, public life is a very difficult one for me to be able to look back and say, when, am I, when was I not public and when was I public? That is hard for me because even in my, nine, in, in my 20s, when I ran two nightclubs in London, I was a private person, but I was very well known, but I was private. 
Um, so I'm not sure necessarily how to answer when did I suddenly become public? Because in some ways, I don't even consider myself um, public. And I think maybe that's why it appears still truthful is because I, I'm always peeling the spiritual onion. I, 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 it's like, for example, on Instagram, I notice a lot of people put public figure. That's fine. It's, a, no, it's all good. It's just I don't think that's part of my archetype. I think it's much more about getting the job done, meeting the people, sharing it. And, and it's for you, the audience, to make the judgment it, it, because that's what people want to do is, am I this, am I that, am I a healer, am I an astrologer, am I a light worker, am I a therapist, the language. And yes, there'll be ways for me to describe it. You know, am I par- private, am I public, I'm both. So I find that, and I'm not trying to be tricky, but I find it very difficult to say, because on the one hand, I could quote to you when I was 13 years old and I read Nostradamus and I downloaded it. I, my French was always fairly good as a young man. And I, I read the quatrains in French and, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it hit somewhere deep. Right. Um, does that mean I was fully awake at 13? Of course not. And then, of course, I went back to sleep because I had to survive in these ghastly English boarding schools. In order to survive, I, 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 it, it, was a, uh, it was a suppression. It was an internal, um, uh, almost a numbing. But, you know, people numb in different ways. People numb through alcohol through sex through drugs through not through work and for me I, I I numbed more just inwardly when I was a, a teenage boy at one of these uh, boarding schools uh, but I, I knew something was strange about the world I knew uh, this wasn't the true frequency of humanity but I didn't think it's been really if I have to la- label the date I'll settle on 2016 because I painted a lot of pictures leading up to the timeline change of 2016. I saw Trump win in 2014. And that's very simple. It's very lonely in New York City to see a man come, uh, see ahead of the time him win, because everyone in New York is so deeply programmed, like they are in the big metropolises. So for me, I think if I had to settle on a date, Paul, I'd settle on 2016. Okay, I love that you've brought this up, because so the thing that's beautiful about sort of the last... I would say the last 24 hours for me is so you've been sort of in my awareness um, for a number of days now and not very long um, in my consciousness, so to speak, but I spent yesterday really going through your work and I really Mm -hmm. wanted to understand and process your energy and just to feel through my heart and your heart sort of coming together. And I really love that you brought up 2016 because I want to speak to a point from an astrology, like an astrology perspective. And the thing that I'm very interested in with what you talked about in one of your videos is that you talked about the 1212 Mayan calendar timeline. And I loved how you were sharing in an interview or a talk how you had shared how that there was basically a delay in light years where Mm. that timeline came into 2016. And I feel very much that I'd like you to just expand on that if you can. I mean, it's very um, enigmatic. But when um, one of the star's supernovas um, blew up or let off a very large um, sonic wave, it took four and a half years for that. It's from Proxima Centauri, Alpha Centauri. And that took just over four years for that light to get to planet Earth. And it shifted the timeline. Now... 2016, you see, you've got to understand, we have to all understand that the deep, dark practitioners who've controlled this realm for many, many thousands of years um, thought they had it in the bag, like they always did, that Hillary um, was not only going to win, that she didn't even have a failure speech. You see, most people, if you think in regards to democracy, if you're going up for an election, you will have prepared your success speech and you will have prepared your failure speech. You know, the speech where you've been elected in and the speech where you haven't quite won. And it's your, it's your, um, I forget the word now, but whatever the term is, is, you know, your condolence, you know, your apologies or whatever it is. And, 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 and you, you don't get to become president. She didn't have that speech because the rigging, the Dominion systems, all the different ways that the system has been controlled for many, many years. Um, the switcheroo was was able to happen. And I'm not going to get into that and how it happened and why it happened right now. But t- 
time travel is part of it. You see, Q is military intelligence. Forget QAnon, there's no such thing as QAnon. Q is military intelligence. And you have the digital anons. They are people who decipher the boards, who decipher what that cryptic symbolic language means because it is very cryptic it has to be because this is the art of war and in 2016 that timeline changed and you know it's connected to the assassination of kennedy it's uh, connected um to many different things i mean it's interesting for example that um the uh funeral um of of jfk and the funeral of princess diana they both had q over the um coffin at, at some stage and actually if you look at where mrs uh, princess diana was buried if you look at from an aerial view she's buried in a lake on her family ancestral home it's actually in the letter q i i mean i digress but 2016 is a very important time and when we look back in many years to come probably for the public will have to be at least three, five more years ahead for people to really understand what shifted in 2016. But it did shift, and I sensed it. As an artist, I was painting uh, subject matter like the fall of man, the resurrection of mankind, and it was all about um, how we can step into a higher level of consciousness, which is what ascension is. You know, it's the Christed light in all of us. You see, at the end of the day, Christ would not want us to remain not only victim, but he wouldn't want us to have the Messiah complex, which is very cleverly engineered by the deep, dark practitioners, because it takes power away from humanity and remain and, and allows it to be remain with the priestly class, with the, the, the controllers in order to manipulate humanity. Beautiful to sort of enter into this. What I love about what you've shared, and I think it's very interesting to me, how you've brought up uh, Princess Diana. And it was mm. interesting. So I go for a walk every every day to ground myself in nature. And it's, you know, a good hour and a half, two hour walk. I hug trees and I do all of these sort of spiritual practices that have been a part of my last 11 years. And this morning, it was really interesting. Um, I did, I, I haven't done this for a while, but I go over this one bridge. And I love the Buddhist tradition of actually letting go and just emptying myself over a bridge with the water flow taking away anything that I wish to empty. And I turn around once I'm empty, sort of of anything that I wanna release and dissolve. And I go back to the stream that wants to bring energy and goodness to me. So I like this practice and I did this today and Diana showed up for me. And it's interesting that you've brought her up. I did, we didn't talk about this before. There was no plan of talking about this, but I think it's interesting because she was very much with me on my walk for that particular part of it, which is sort of like the start where we start to turn around. And I always think there's there's a reason why things happen when they happen. So in my awareness, I felt very, um, I think actually um, a love for Diana, the way that I felt her today was so crystal clear. And the people's princess sort of came into my awareness. And I think more than anything in this, what I recognize in these um, shifting of times is that we are we are here to sort of um, receive the baton that has been passed to us from our ancestors. And in doing so, the cosmos can come through and support us. And I love how Wayne Dyer in much of his work always said, you know, in the womb, you always received whatever it was that you needed. Why is it that when you when you are born, once you're outside of the womb, why do you think anything changes? You're always getting and receiving what you need to thrive. And I like to sort of bring this into our talk, maybe with what you've brought up with Princess Diana, because I think it's important to remember for anyone in these times that we are receiving really important nourishing energies and sustaining of life force energy right now. And I think, you know, from that 2016 sort of line that I felt intuitively when you brought it up in a talk I was watching of you yesterday in researching, you, I really wanted to sort of start there because in 2016 was also sort of how we would have met, you and I. And I'd like to sort of go into how we met and the importance of, I think, that. So I'd like to open up sort of a slideshow essentially um, of a card deck that I've put together. So I'm just going to do that. And we'll just sort of shift over to this. And it's actually small. There we go. 
it's large now. So I'm going to just hit play. And what I'd like to just sort of, I think, take a moment to do is share how I think ultimately this, uh, this beautiful uh, person sitting before us named George H. Lewis um, has come into, um, I think, just the stream of your work. So George H. Lewis is a healer, artist, and polymath based partly in New York City and then mainly on the International Road. His work focuses around his greatest passion, inspiring people to help, uh, sorry, to step into their highest version of themselves. The healing arts are transformative in their ability through sound and vibration, as well as painting, to recalibrate people so they are more aligned with their soul contract, a celebration of the human potential, human intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. I love how you brought this up because you already said something about this, so it's perfect. George has been interested in the spiritual and esoteric world since he was a young man. After graduating with a first class degree in politics and political philosophy from Padua University in Italy, George pursued a painting career. He lived in the Middle East between 2007 and 2012, where he was the court painter to the Sultan of Oman and exhibited his paintings and photographs throughout the Arabian Peninsula. George has accumulated some unique perspectives from this time living with the the Bedouin tribes in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Yemen, and Oman. And I think I'd like to pause there. And if this is okay with you, um, while we're there in that little snapshot of time, I'd like to just ask you um, sort of what was going on as you were sort of leaving that space or what was going on in your heart. When I was living in the Middle East, you mean? Yes, exactly. Oh, I absolutely loved that time. I mean, it was a very sensual time. I mean, the the smells, the juniper, the myrrh, the frankincense, um, mm. food, um, the culture. It's so very, very different, of course, to what mainstream media has desired it to be uh, uh, depicted because the whole Western, well, it's not, it's not just really Western, it's a global protocol of division. And one of the soft ways to create division since the Second World War, uh, especially since the creation of Israel, has been the Arab issue. Um, and so my 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 take on, and I know them. I knew the Middle East very very well. I've been to pretty much every country, mm -hmm. so I have real practical experience. And uh, they're beautiful people. They're very clean. They're very sensual. They're very um, connected to, especially in the desert, <laughs> to the stars. I mean, it's a tough existence, of course, if you're living with Bedouin. I'm not saying it was easy spending, you know, many weeks in the desert. Um, but obviously living in Oman was very, very nice and I, I was very well looked after, but I made some very nice local friends. I think it really taught me an awful lot about humanity. Um, I mean, God, I could say so much. I, I could go in many different directions here. You, know, you have to guide me. Yeah, and I love that you've brought it up because I think that what is gorgeous about what you've just shared is the smells. I love sensual, um, you know, we have the senses, right? So this opens up our um, understanding from a different perspective from someone that's actually experienced it. So that's why I wanted to sort of pause there and just give you a moment to sort of expand on that energy. But I love that you brought up the smells and the fragrances and just the, I think ultimately the experience and energy of what you experienced in that. Um, and it's really... I think having studied world religions um, and understanding that religion is, you know, in the cult or culture of people, it's very interesting to me how there's different versions of storylines that have been told to us over the years and the intentional, um, quite frankly, uh, you know, call it what, whatever you like, but there's a lot of misinformation about I think ultimately the truth and the truth is the experience of the heart and the soul that exists and dwells within human beings. And, you know, everyone has a mother and a father and um, there's beautiful sort of nuances in that. So I love that you've shared that, thank you. And I'll just continue reading. It was during this period that George came to know and read the stars well. From under the vastness of the Arabian desert, he began to learn and appreciate their symbolic meanings. Between 2013 and 2016, George studied archetypal astrology in New York City under the supervision of a number of mentors, including Monty Taylor and the infamous Frank Andrews, Princess Grace and John Lennon psychic, going in depth into a number of different but overlapping disciplines, including ancient Hellenistic astrology, tarot and palmistry. In 2015, George was commissioned to paint 
the royal family of Bhutan by applying his knowledge of astrology, he was able to do a more in-depth psychological interpretation of the sitter, which he applies to all his commissions. It was in Bhutan, while painting, that he had the opportunity to work closely with a number of spiritual leaders and monks who taught George the power of vibrational sound bowl healing. It was like a memory from a past life returned, and he was able to pick up his talent quite quickly. In 2016, George was also appointed an ambassador for the Kingdom of Bhutan's gross national happiness metric system, where he was asked to give lectures around the world on the spiritual dimension of happiness and what his true value is. In 2017, George qualified in New York City as a sound bowl healer using ancient Eastern protocols and practices. George's core interest lies in revealing the true essence and potential of the individual and reminding people of their inherent cosmic connection. Through the language of archetypal astrology and the universal language of frequency, we are able to reconnect to the mystical realm of existence, thus integrate the material with the immaterial and synthesize the Western and Eastern perspectives. What I think is so beautiful about this, and the thing that I, you know, I've sat on the other side of many interviews where people read a biography um, to some, you know, to some, you know, past time that I haven't been in for a while. And oftentimes I sort of cringe, um, but I really think what I wanted to make sure that I did, and I try to do whenever I have someone, is this is how you've arrived today with me, with each other. Anyone that's watching this is because this happened. Um, and I wanted to honor you for, for the work that you've done to get to this moment in this cocoon. So to just sort of amplify and expand on that, I'd like to sort of dive into a little bit of your healing work, if that's okay. So I've been a, you know, it's funny because people see me often as a healer. And I realized today, and in reflecting to prepare for today, I realized that I have been healing, you know, in the healing world let's call it i was a massage therapist for um you know in my early 20s i went to school to college for a couple of years for that and i worked in a clinic and a hospital and i treated many people um over that time and i realized today i've really been doing this for a lot longer than i sort of admit to myself and i wanted to ask you how you feel that you've been a healer um, more than just this moment but more i think in your heart and soul for your life um, and I want to ask yeah. you what that's like. Yeah. Well, I've always been very psychic. Um, so, you know, the more one uses it, the better one becomes. And I mean, I, I remember when I was nine, maybe, maybe 12, better age, 12 years old, turning to my mother and telling her a few things about some of her friends and her being a little bit shocked because I can't, I shouldn't say that. And, you know, from a societal point of view, she's absolutely right. How could I know that? And why should, and I must not say it. So I, I learned quite early on, you know, in society to survive, one really can't say what one feels or make comments about things like that. But I, I've, I've always been very, I've always been a musician. I've always loved sound. Um, I think all human beings do actually when they're allowed to. So it's always been there for me and just I, I think I'm able to integrate these gifts I think it's because I've done it in many past lives not, and not just on this planet but you know it's um it's another way of of, of, of reflecting the divine exploring um sharing the divine language which is um something for us all to partake in when we are free well, and I, what I really love about your work, and it's interesting because, you know, I've had a, a many, you know, many opportunities to have different people, and I'm very selective about who I really sort of want to have on um, really my, my, my channel, if, if you will. And I've met many different astrologers and many different people, um, but I have to say you're someone that really stood out to me. Um, your astrology to me is so point, it's just so poignant in its, I think it's resolve. And the thing that I loved in one of the videos that I saw um, sort of predicting sort of 2020 in some of your review of the, the stars and the star systems and the alignments, you were so, so spot on um, in a way that I loved how accurate you were without really sort of giving predictions. And I really liked your, um, I think your care in how you shared that sort of time because it was quite challenging for everyone to go through that massive 
um, last three years. And it's sort of why I really um, kind of was drawn to you was how you, I think, ultimately share your gifts. So you're a healer in a way that I've, I've not met many. Um, so I wanted to just give you really just, um, I think, some, some light to the Thank powerful you. work that you've done um, and just make sure that our community knows about you that way. So I'm going to move on to the next slide here. And I just, you know, I put this in just quickly, but astrology and healing. George provides a range of astrology therapy and healing services, including private appointments and group workshops in Manhattan and just hosts locations around the world. And I think that that's incredible. So as you sort of, um, you know, this was probably before a lot of things happened, but more and more, this is going to start to become, I think, more focused for all of us to need certain things that haven't really maybe be mainstream. And as we sort of heal together and come together in all the pieces that we are, we're sort of the, the people that I think are in our communities to hold um, this, this idea together so that people can receive what's required to really heal. Um, and a true healer really allows the person that actually is the person to heal. We just hold the space. That's sort of my... my yeah, I if I can share uh, an insight into healing, yes. I think that there are four components I've identified for healing, which are really important. The first is healer has to operate at a specific Hertz frequency. Um, I'm not going to say label it, but it's going to be between alpha and beta. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be in a state where they can pull in source through their vessel number one number two they do have to unconditionally love the patient with whom they're working number three they do actually have to love themselves that is often a very challenging part of the empath healer's journey the third one this is in no particular order i'm just it's my order the third is to love oneself and then the fourth would be to see the other the patient healed on the other side when one can operate integrating those four aspects of healing it's very very powerful wow and i think just this is why i love you so much already um because there's very few people that would would stop me and say what needs to be said that way and quite frankly um thank you for for your um i think just following your complete whole energy field to know what to say exactly in that moment because there's nothing more true than what you just said that's actually how healing happens and you know i personally am a work in progress i have worked on loving myself more and i i have negative thoughts and negative thinking and i have a lot of programs that you know i've internalized i was abused and there's many things that i'm still working on so it's a work in progress for me as a healer but i do think that what you just said is really really important um so i've written them down and i'll put a list down um in the uh, field below when you're watching this so you can review the compassion that. the compassion you can have for the patient is profound if you're open like you are to the the, the trauma that you've experienced and everyone just to, to a greater or lesser extent has experienced trauma on this planet this is up until this point a trauma planet still so the healer uh becomes the healed uh, the healed becomes the healer you know it, it it's there's a cycle circle almost so as long as you know you keep that heart open and you keep on pulling in the Christed light, and one can pull it from many different directions. I mean, I do feel what I just shared, a truth is just coming in through me and out. I'm literally just regurgitating it. It's, it's a truth, and I'm just the communicator, the messenger. It, it, it can be Andromedan, it can be Palladian, it can be Christ consciousness, it can be angelic. I tend not to get caught up in, in the... Um, the the, the mode through which it comes, I just find it delicious that it comes through many different people. Um, I happen to love the conversations about what is Christ did light, how does it show up uh, through the angelic realm, through the Gaia realm, through the shamanism realm, through the galactic realm, which is something I feel very uh, uh, close to, but all of them. So it's, it's it, and part of it also should be fun because when we're in our joy, when we're in our our bliss and we're doing it like the puer the eternal child uh, that's for me it's because i have a leo ascendant i i i'm i really when i'm doing it i'm very childlike and that's why i'm 
it, it, it works because I'm just a vessel. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, I think just, you know, what, how, how clear that is just so resonant in the heart space and the soul space with source. Um, it's, that was delicious. <laughs> so thank you very much. I have this lovely crystal right in front of me. I'm just touching it. It's going to see how beautiful it is. I'm just gorgeous. Yeah. Thank you so much. I um, chose actually a different candle and it has sort of a similar color glass as you and I never use this candle. So it's sort of interesting. They sort of match the color. <laughs> Um, but that said, so I put a couple of pictures up just to show um, the incredible work that you do in this, you know, this particular way. Um, and I know that you heal in lots of different ways with art. So I just I'll fast forward to this. So I wanted to sort of take a moment to give um, honor to, I think, ultimately creation and the cosmos for the, how this came to be. And I took the I took the opportunity to sort of um, open this up because I wanted to, first of all, thank you for speaking about essentially nihilism. This is something that I have not studied much of, but when you spoke with um, Dr. Christian Northrup, who is really how I met in 2016, there's that year again, okay? So I like to just give honor to that 2016 moment because this actually is how I would have met you. And that's the divine dance of the universe, you know, circling around the sun and the moon and the stars and space and timelessness. But this divine moment actually changed my life. And it was interesting because this year I was sort of struggling um, a little bit, I think in October, November, just for being a bit depressy. Like, and I don't really get, I mean, it's very odd for me to get like that and to let it really like weigh me down. And what was very interesting to me is how you spoke and I just came across this, I don't really know how, cause I wasn't really looking for it, but it popped up and I knew to watch it. And it was you and uh, Chris uh, having a conversation and I would like you to speak to nihilism um, if you would. I mean, nihilism is, is very, is very insidious because it's it's very clever it comes in in many different ways yes we've got the philosophical nihilism of basically the suggestion that humankind is absurd it's very atheistic i mean if you only have to look at the 20th se 20th century modern art i mean this is where i've always been very clear as a soul there is never confusion for me and forgive me i i promise you this isn't coming out of any form of ego or arrogance um from get go in this incarnation, contemporary art, modern art, 20th century art was an abomination because it was in such denial and abject opposition to anything godly. And for me, I don't, I'm not big into the scriptures. I, I'll take parts of it beautiful. I'm not big into doctrine, but it is so antithetical to Christ consciousness, to love to aspirations of consciousness and beauty and bringing humans together in a frequency or a vibration that is harmonious and ultimately healing. Everything, and I'm generalizing, everything is very left brain. It's very masculine, intellectual, nihilistic. It's always dealing with problems uh, or identifying problems, creating separation creating false truths, very clever, intellectual hyperbole, very clever. And I, I don't forget, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a poster boy for this. I went to one of the very best schools in Britain. Let me be very clear to your listeners. I, I, I was deeply programmed. So, you know, I understand what the whole system is about, the educational system. It's to keep us in a very specific bandwidth. Yes, bandwidth. When we're in that frequency, as Prince once said, the prize is the soul. And nihilism basically has sought to pretend to you all that you don't have a soul, so you can be controlled. So really, at the end of the day, if you look at it through the alchemical process, Saturn sits on his throne. Obviously, he's cold and degenerate and evil and controlling. But more importantly, Mars, which is in all of us, doesn't matter whether we're in a male or a female body, is sat slumped at the seat of Saturn with his bows broken, his inability for virility, his inability to bear children, his inability to lift anything, to use any form of strength in order to defend the holy 
you know, sacredness of life, of children, of women, of his fellow friendships, of men. And Venus is, sits in her squalor and her excrement through so much excessive um, lovemaking, which of course isn't lovemaking. And then of course Mercury sits there and jibber jabbers, talks absolute nonsense. What is up is down, what is left is right. Do you see how much it makes sense today, what's happening? Everything is so nihilistic. Now, the other side of nihilism, of course, is the more corporeal, the more uh, bodily effects, and deliberate through the dark practitioners of chemtrails, of poisoning the water, of polluting our foods, of basically filling our entire system with nonsense so we're weaker, so we're more controlled. And so I have a lot of compassion for the people on this planet who do represent and often spout absolute gibberish, think Mercury, uh, a broken Mercury, you know, because they have just been fed inside and out, intellectually, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Remember the four elements, it's critical here when we understand healing and when we understand dystopian views and, and control, it's always going to be through the four elements. You can't just hit it physically. You have to hit it physically, which is earth. You have to hit it uh, emotionally through water. You have to hit it mentally through air. And you have to hit it, of course, spiritually through the plasma, through fire. So, you know, it's been very, very clever over many, many decades, indeed thousands of years, but ramped up beyond since the Second World War of defeating um, the divine abilities of humanity to ascend. No. And so the timeline shift of 2016 is thus, we have to have the great reset in our faces, right up rubbing up against our nose. The threat of tyranny has to be so visible and so palpable because you can't tell people the truth. They have to feel it. And I learned that many years ago. And that taught me a huge amount of compassion, but also something I naturally lack, patience. Well, I wanted to thank you for this conversation about it. And I know it was very interesting to me. I teach a class right now on Saturdays and I had watched your video last week and I had brought in nihilism into my class. And it was very interesting to me because what I realized, um, it was almost an out of body experience for me to share what happened. Um, but I, I admitted to myself, first of all, that I was a bit slippery, slippery into that, like that insidious little slip into not feeling good enough, not feeling love. And I'm teaching a how to love yourself class here. So it was very, um, I just felt like out of balance is a good way to maybe say this. And it was so creeping into me little by little, like this little, quite frankly, demonic energy and i was like i just with what you said you were just like no stop it just stop it that's enough and what was so beautiful is when i shared that with um some version of that with um my class everyone was they you know they googled nihilism and looked into it and it that it's that intentional minimizing of the soul and the connection to god and that how that can just just slowly creep in by little bits and it's a program so i think what's powerful is to clear yourself and i know the first nations in canada i was just with my sisters and they just say to do this you just put your hands here and you clear it and it's that simple so you just clear out your entire field everything so i really i think that there's something really important to remind people of right now that this is very much how you really collapse this system that has been programmed into us and that little insidious depression that can kind of come um and i think having my father take his own life i'm very aware of it you know and I, it makes me very conscious to say this out loud to people and i i like to use myself as when this happens to me it means that it can happen to you when it happens to each of us we have to stand up and put our rod in the ground literally and say no I do not consent to that. I am a child of God. I am source energy. So I really loved that you brought this up. And I think it's so interesting that it was with Dr. Christian Northrup, who is how I met Louise Hay. And how I was teaching that class was because of this moment where my song was used 
to honor her life's work. You know, Louise Hay, the last birthday she had, what many don't know about this if you're new to me, but, and I wanna share this with you, is she actually died listening to my music. She transitioned listening to my music. And I'm very, very close friends with Alia who took care of Louise for the last 15 years of her life and was with her when she transitioned. So this is a really monumental moment for me when I saw this moment with you, um, George. And I just wanna say again, thank you. And for anyone that's struggling, just really clear your field and understand what nihilism is and really look into it and research it and learn about it. Um, so just moving on, the last thing I wanted to do is just give light to uh, essentially your website so that people can find you. So I put this up just this is from a screenshot from your website and it's georgehlewis.com. And this is your amazing Instagram where we sort of connected. I love these social medias used for good. So this is where George, you can find George's uh, Instagram. And then I just have to tell you, I put this together just because this is just a snapshot of just your energy and your beauty and your kindness and your grace and your, your holiness. And I thought it was really interesting. You paint your beautiful paintings on so many different, um, you know, surfaces, but I thought that it, Steinway's my favorite piano in the world. I recorded my album Worthy on it. And when I saw this, I didn't realize you painted it actually. And then when I realized it was you that painted it, I was like, oh my God, that's incredible. Um, so I just have to ask you, what is this like to paint a piano like this? It was fun. I mean, you know, it was my first, it's the only one I've done so far. I mean, um, gosh, what, I, what could I say? Uh, it was a great experience. It was beautiful experience. Uh, it took you know over, well over a year to do, and I have I had my wonderful assistant who worked for me for seven years helping me. But it was a real privilege, and it was fun to get to know people in Steinway. It was an old-fashioned firm. Um, I think the pandemic has been quite tough on them. They had to shut down for you know a year and a half, yeah. uh, but uh, it was it was beautiful um, to, to 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 make that piece and i'd love to i'd love to have the opportunity to do more in the future actually yeah it's you know it's interesting i remember i've never really fallen in love with a piano in my life like i mean like literally fallen it like as a musician you play the piano so you know but i remember and this was just the cosmos but i played and recorded my album worthy when i was really in 2012 really sort of going through some serious healing and this piano i don't know what happened but it was like it was an extension of my entire being. And I've never had a piano since or ever, you know, ever had that experience ever again, where it was, I was one with the piano in a way that I've never been one with the piano. And it was a Steinway. And I remember finding out it was worth about a hundred thousand dollars. It was a really expensive one. And yeah. um, I remember thinking one day I'll be able to afford that piano. And I, I will hold my energy for it because it's, it's one of those things that um, I've never experienced anything like it. So to paint on it and for you to be a piano player, your energy in that piano must just be incredible. Did you play this piano? Oh, yes. Uh, many times. Yeah. I bet you did. That's so cool. Um, okay. So I wanted to just give some light now to one of the most beautiful things that I think I've seen of your work that's up to date, you know, in that way. And it's the boy and the boy king. And I haven't, I don't have a copy of it, but I wanted to share the visual. Um, uh, essentially, I guess, it, you know, the, the collection that you shared, that's a video stream. So I'm going to do that next. But before we do that, and we'll end with that, I wanted to just ask you before you sort of, um, before you, everyone sees this, I want to ask you about what this book is and what it means to you. I mean, this book is very important to me, actually. Um, so my son is 14 years old. He's called Arthur. My daughter, I have a daughter as well called Ellie, and she's nearly 13. They live with their mother. Um, Arthur is very, uh, is very special to me. He always has been. And um, he has a little, he still does. <laughs> he has a little bun bun. And um, when he was younger, I mean, well, I don't know, I could share so much. I mean, that boy, as all children are, uh, so connected to source, stories of past lives, mm -hmm. some of them beautiful, some of them very tragic. And um, it came to me very quickly that I, I must write this book about him, time traveling back to ancient Egypt. And he plays with this uh, 
young king called Tutankhamun. And obviously he is a king and Arthur's just a boy from New York, but the boys play beautifully. And it's about friendship, you know, peace, not, not, not war. It's ultimately about freedom, but it's also about something else. It's about, it's about time travel too. And this is, and I wrote, I started writing this with, I actually co-wrote it with a friend of mine called Arthur Lebeau. It's quite funny. He's called Arthur as well. Mm. And he used to live next door to my house upstate. And, um, it was fun to write with him because he was he's very organized and he would help sort of collate all my ideas and and stuff because I, a lot of the paintings I painted, I channeled. And of course, some of them are from memories from living in the Middle East. It's a real mixture. But the book was so much about the symbology of time travel and our relationship to the cosmos. Of course, if you look at the three pyramids in Giza, they do totally mirror uh, the belt of Orion in the constellation of Orion. That is no accident. Yeah. And, and how they were built, and, and really they were energy systems. They, were part, they are the leftover from Atlantis. Now, I'm not, I wasn't going to write all that in this children's book for adults. I wanted it to get out there to children. But when you start to read it, you will see there's a lot of symbolism and hidden meaning in the book. One of the things I just have to share, so I've been to Egypt once um, and it was the most alchemical experience I've ever had. I knew I needed to go when I went. It was one of those moments. It was actually the first day of Ramadan. I didn't plan this at all. And I will never forget going to the pyramids. And what was so wild is like where you think you know something and you know nothing and then you know everything. And it was just this odd juxtaposition. And I remember going, and as you come up to the pyramids, the energy around that is one one wild little ride. And the thing that was fascinating is the day I went, no one was there. And I had got I had hired a few people that were very safe to take us. There had just been a bombing, actually. Um, so we were a little bit cautious going. And there was nobody at the pyramids, which is very unusual. The man that was actually taking us was very surprised and he's done this for 20 years and it, he said I don't know why there's no one here it's never this is not how it normally is and um, this is pre-COVID and the thing that's very interesting to me I knew I needed to put my album Seeds of Peace on the base of the pyramid so this was we were in Egypt for literally like two nights it was very very short in and out sort of at the end of a trip and there was this swarm of bees that came around us and this man was like, I don't know what this is, but I've never had bees ever come near me, near the pyramids. And we ended up, this whole thing was going around. I needed to go around the pyramids one time is what I needed to do. So I, I and the only way to go around on the back is on camels. So I knew that I needed to do this. I've, I'm a little bit scared of animals, so I did this, but I went around the pyramids and at the end of it, I bought three pyramids um, just to make sure that I had the energy. <laughs> Um, and they were made out of crystal. And the thing that is very interesting to me about your book is that I feel like when I was a boy, I used to envision me going to the pyramids. I think I've been there before, um, probably a past life or maybe on another planet. Um, and I was very aware of what was going on. But I think what's very interesting to me about your book is that I think that there is an alchemy in all of us that need to understand the pyramids. And it has to do with Pi. And it has to do with a very important part of the cosmos. And we are connected in a way that is very similar, in my opinion, to the pyramidal um, sphere, is what I like yes. to say. So I love how you, I love how you uh, shared this. And what I just want to do is show the trailer of your uh, book. Thank you. And then we will just basically end up. Just bear with me for two seconds while I do this. I think this should work nicely. And I can edit if I need to. All right. Hello, my name is Bun Bun. I'm the so-called imaginary friend of eight-year-old Arthur. Imaginary, I mean really. Yes, I'm just a stuffed animal, and certainly I can be a little bit stuffy, but actually I'm a wonderfully bright, terribly English, jolly clever bunny. We imaginary friends spend a lot of time at the bottom of book bags, hidden from view. And that explains why we're so very well read. One day, Arthur's teacher caught him speaking to me. She instantly scheduled a meeting with the headmaster. 
We have to get away. And that night, a beam of ancient starlight took us back in time. To pyramids and tribes of nomads. The Sphinx was so happy to see us, she let go of millennia of stress. The next day, oh the next day, we encountered the boy king, King Tut. The fun a boy and a boy king can have. They wage friendship, not war, swinging over the Nile, sailing the breadth of the great river, and riding chariots over the dunes and into the night sky. So how did we return to New York? Well, you'll just have to read my book, won't you? Beautiful. And I think uh, I think it speaks for itself. I, I'm, I can't wait to have copies of this. I will give this as a gift. I can tell the paintings alone are, um, I'd love to have a print of, of so many of these paintings. So there's so many elements to that um, energy. And I want to ask you just before we sort of end this, you know, sort of beautiful, um, I think just snapshot of, of beauty that we've shared from our hearts. I'm an artist from my heart. I think and know that you're an artist from your heart and your soul. And when you create something that's once within you, then that comes outside of you, we need to, as creators and co-creators, really honor the importance of what that is. And I just want to ask you sort of, I think to end this is, what does it feel like to now have something that is so meaningful to you that was once inside of you now on the outside of the world? Um, I think I'm quite used to that in the sense of when I paint something which I've done all my life, or in this case, paint a book and write the book, I want to share it with people because humans are very, very traumatized. And any form of artwork helps with the healing process. So the healing aspect overrides any other thing. Mm -hmm. And I think just to me, like the one of the things that I loved that you shared is how I loved when I watched how this came to be and how life and the art sort of mirrored heaven on earth, where it was your son. I remember just watching this beautiful moment where um, you took a picture or someone had taken a picture of your son on the swing and then you put the backdrop of that beautiful sort of yes. cosmos behind it. Um, right. And it really touched my heart in a way that I just thought, you know, as a, imagine I didn't have a father that was very connected that way, but he was spiritual in his own way. But the gift that you've given your son to even have that in in a moment in reality in a book is one of the most beautiful gifts you could, I think, give your son in a way that you shared love with the world in that way. So. I mean, it, it's interesting on, on that subject because uh, neither of my children have actually read the book. I've given it to them. But that's fairly fairly standard what probably happens with families. But I am also divorced. You know, it's been two years. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I mean, whether, my son and I are very close, uh, which is lovely. He's such a beautiful soul. Not an easy life living in New York City, that's for sure. No, absolutely. And I think just to end this, I think just, you know, I wanted to give some light to what that is. You know, you've created something for the future um, that your son will have. And I know when whenever anyone looks back in their life review, whenever that is, I know for me, when I look back at my father, I remember all of the light moments and the other things just dissolve. Um, they don't matter actually. And it's beautiful when you sort of get to that point, I think, and I'm sure you've had something similar with your parents where you get to the point where you become your own parent, but you understand they're human and they did the best they could. Um, but I just, I really wanted to just give you, um, you know, some praise and some honor for just this gift to the world. And I can't wait to, sh to share it with everyone. Um, and I can't wait to hold it in my hands. I look forward Thank to it. Thank you, Paul, so much. Well, I mean, the book does mean a lot to me and I, I I long for more and more people to read it. It's, it's actually now on display at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City, which is great. And I, and I do sell prints of the work as well. That's fantastic. So I think just what I'll do is I'll end it with that and we'll do a pause to be continued maybe for yes. another time maybe. Um, and I think just more than anything, I want to thank you for your time. 
Thank you so much, Paul. It's been a real pleasure ch sharing and chatting with you today. You're such a brilliant artist yourself. I love your music very much. Thank you so much. And we'll pause there. And thank you so much if you're watching and take care of yourself. Bye, everyone. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show your love. Where there is injury, I'll bring pardon. Where there is doubt, I'll bring the faith. Where there is darkness, I'll bring the light. And where there's sadness